Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to the scriptures for us. Lord, you are the great teacher. Without you, we are looking words on the page. Lord, you are the God and us today and be with us and spend your word. And let us give you all the honor of Lord. Thank you for that show of Jesus. Pray in Jesus' name. Oh, we're in Jeremiah. Chapter, I started chapter four today. I was reading it last night, so I was it. It's quite a quite a quite a section we're in. Up to the middle of chapter six, it's like, and there's unfortunately there is so much parallel with what's going on in our country right now. Did you print out our papers or no? I printed them out last week. You should have gone last oh, week, you yeah. have for this week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've already read verses one and two last week. We covered verses one and two last week. So we're going to start reading it verses first. Let's start with verse three and four. I'll read. Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and remove the foreskins of your heart. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. That's a chilling. First, I want to make uh, verse three. The verse of the word thorns is mentioned 43 times in the Bible, uh, which is kind of interesting. And God uses it in a specific way. Um, Luke 8, verses 4 through 8. This will be familiar to you. <clears throat> now, when a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road. And that was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil. When it came up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And yet, other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as much. As he said these things, he would call out, The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. And thorns are a way, uh, what God is trying to tell them, and again, we're told the same thing too. Our hearts need to be prepared for the Word of God. We need to be looking at God, um, studying His Word, and being open or fertile soil or uh, able to receive, I guess. You know, if um, someone gives you a check, for a hundred thousand dollars, and you have a bank account, it's a nice looking check, but you can't do anything with it. Check cashing service is not going to cash a check for a hundred thousand dollars. You go open a bank account so you put it in and actually use the money that they gave you. Likewise, if you're getting uh, reading the word of God and you're just reading it and it's just words on a page, then it's not going to mean anything to you, which is sad, but many people read the Bible that way. We're called upon to be a separate, peculiar people. And we need to watch out for the thorns in our life. Good morning, Mike. You're muted. Just so you know, Michael. Your microphone is muted. And you can hear me. If you go down to the bottom of the page, you're with your mouse, you'll see the little bar will come up. There you go. Now. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> We're in chapter four today, Mike. We just read verses three and four. Okay. Thorns. I mentioned the fact that uh, thorns mentioned forty-three times in the Bible. Uh, we need to have our hearts ready to receive the word of God. We can read. Uh, we can be 
it is later we'll be talking about seeing and cannot see, hearing and cannot hear. Just reading the word of God and studying it. We have to have our heart prepared. This side of the cross, this side of the cross, we are fortunate that we have the Holy Spirit that helps us to the scripture. Um, other side of the cross, for the cross, people can read and that they saw God with their own heart to a side, but we have the interpreter living inside us. He said to his disciples, it's better for me to leave and go back to heaven because when I go, I can send the interpreter, the Holy Spirit, the interpreter, to be with you and teach you all things that I told you. Yeah, we have that Holy Spirit living inside us, helping us read and understand what God is telling us. Let's look at the next section. Um, oh, one more thing. I'm talking about Jeremiah 4 4. Circumcision. Uh, for circumcision, this point, it's not very good. Put it that way. What they do at the end of the day, they hold the old testament. Circumcision, all the place, um, it's always that it's healthy for male children. God calls on us to circumcise ourselves and remove the foreskins of your heart. There was covering your heart. Um, God, looking at the New Testament, wants to look up Romans 2, verse 25. And here, Paul is talking about, and throughout the New Testament, Paul talks about, and Paul, of course, being a, a Jew's Jew, a Pharisee, he would relate everything back to the law. Circumcision was a practice that the Jews had to separate themselves from their uh, nation around them. And it was a command from the Lord. But Jews, unfortunately, thought, well, if I'm circumcised, I'm okay. I'm going to heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm in for an eternal reward and God will bless What the um, Bible's telling us here, what Jeremiah is saying, and what Paul was saying, is circumcision is a physical act, but God intended it to be a spiritual act as well. We have to circumcise our hearts. He talks about, God continues to talk about, you um, have, have a hard heart, you're hard hearted, you can't receive the word. If we're not following after God, uh, it's, it's wrong. And we need to make sure that we are open to what God has. Again, back to verse 3. Break up your fellow ground. Do not so among the points. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And not just not just physical circumcision, but spiritual circumcision. And God warns, hey, if you don't do this, men of Judah and have it spiritual, my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Now, let's look at verses, let's read verses 5 through 18. Up from his state, 
and the destroyer of nations is on the way, he has gone forth from his place to make your land from the city will be like a waste without inhabitant, with the cloth itself, with sackcloth, le lemon, and, and wailing, where the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us, and it shall come to pass in the days, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish in the heart of the priest. The priest will be astonished, and the prophet shall wonder. Then I said, ah, Lord God, surely you have great to uh, see his people in people have peace, whether the sword reaches to the heart. At the time, it will be said to the people of Jerusalem, a dry wind of display heights low in the in the wilderness towards the daughters of my people, not to fan nor to clean. The winds too strong for those for those will come for me. Now I will also speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come up like a cloud and his his chariot like a whirlwind, his hero, his horses are swift than swifter than eagles. Woe to us for we are plunder. Okay, let's stop there. Because there's a lot in here we should talk about. Okay. Okay. Um, study of verse five. Um, yeah, God is giving him a warning. He first he told us that the, he's going to declare judgment. Um, he's telling everyone he's bringing evil from the north. Who would that be at this time period? Who's God sending down from the north? The Babylonians. Babylonians. Morning, Lori. You're home this morning. Sorry. Good morning. Students, uh, students are on vacation, so we cool. begin work at eight instead of seven thirty. Honest, well, that's very nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> By the way, just so everybody knows, we had seventy-eight people in church this Sunday, which is awesome. Praise God. <clears throat> Both we've had even pre-COVID for a long time, so. Yeah. Praise God. We were all socially distanced. We, we did all right. Thank God. Anyway, moving, I'm moving forward. Oh, one more thing. The uh, sermon I posted on our YouTube channel, and I got the whole service and I got the sermon. If you get a chance, listen to it again. That was a tremendous sermon he did. So it's not, I was, it was incredible, I thought. And I'll mention one more thing. Tonight is, uh, um, we begin studying the disciples. And I don't know if it's going. It's supposed to be available via. Don't know if it's going to be Zoom or um, Facebook Live. I think Pastor will decide that during the day. I've got some suggestions for him. And look for your e inboxes for email. I'll send it to John. You know what it is I don't. For what he said, he wanted. He said from the pulpit, he wants to do it down here. Oh, okay. So we'll see. And if we get more than ten people, we're not going to be down. I'll be moving up the station. Anyway, it should be a, a study of the disciples going to do three a week for four weeks. So it should be an interesting Bible study. Yeah. God bless you. I digress. And we look here, we look further, bringing down people from the north and great destruction. Again, God is using Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you. God is using Nebuchadnezzar as a as a uh, where are we in Jeremiah? We're in Jeremiah 4. Oh, okay. I've been in, I, I thought you said 2 uh, through 18. I was wondering why I couldn't follow along. Yeah, it's, it's 4. Uh, just, we're in 4 and 5 today. Yeah, but you can change your last <laughs> It's and it's That's my what allergies. I thought. So, yeah. My allergies this morning have been trees. Um, I take an allergy pill and a suit of bed, and I'm, I'm holding my own, but I'm still getting the post nasal drip thing on. Mm. Um, okay. So we're in verse uh, talking about verse seven. A lion has gone from the thicket, destroyer of the nation is set up, gone off from a place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitants. For this put on sackcloth, lament and wail, verse eight, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. 
And again, God here is talking about judgment, falling on the nation, judging them for their lack of following him and turned away from him. And if God does, <clears throat> my comment to all of this, <clears throat> I'm reading this yesterday and I've been studying this all week. If God didn't spare his chosen people, the people that he calls his own, how's he going to spare us? As a, we are far away from God right now as a nation. Read the paper if you don't believe it. It's a shame. Um, should come about in a day, and again, it's astonishment. It's it's all happening at once. Um, if you recall, Babylon, who got judged because of the harshness with which he treated Israel, God brought about the Babylonian Empire's demise in a day. I mean, it was longer than a day, but the final thrust was all in one night, and it was done. Um, the handwriting was on the wall, literally, in that on that night. Um, that God was going to judge them. So we move forward. And, the, and interesting here, and, and priests, okay, the priests will be appalled and the prophets will be astounded. And remember at this time, we had a lot of false prophets in here saying, everything's fine, no problem. We're not, we're not coming under judgment. We're God's chosen people. We're going to be okay. God's not going to judge us. He won't allow us to be destroyed. Um, and God's word promises, and you should see the references. I could have written them all out, or I could have written them all down. But the references to Deuteronomy and Moses' warning to the people are just astounding and detailing exactly what God will do if they turn away. And God's judgment from Deuteronomy is coming out here. You're seeing what you're seeing here is God's giving back to them and telling them through Jeremiah the destruction that he promised in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, the book of the law that Moses gave, and Moses warned them. And it's specific that a nation will come uh, with language you don't understand, uh, and they're going to take you away. And kill you, kill you and take you away. Those of you who are killed are going to away. And as we know, when the Babylonians did come, now did they destroy, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the wall. Um, they took away the best and the brightest. They killed many. And the ones that were left were the weak and the feeble. They left them to till the, to till the soil for them and, and grow the grapes that were still there. <laughs> so it was not a, not, not a pleasant time in Israel's history. And now verse 10. Then I said, Oh, Lord, surely you've utterly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying you will have peace, whereas the sword touches the throat, meaning peace, peace, when there is no peace. Sword touches the throat means you're, you're, if it's about to end, your, your judgment's about to come. It's right, it's, it's now, it's not future, it's now. In that time, it will be said to this people unto Jerusalem, a scorching wind from the bare heights in the wilderness in the direction of the daughter of my people, not to winnow and not to cleanse, a wind too strong for this will come. At my command, now I will also pronounce judgments against them. We got into verse 13 and 14. Behold, he goes up like clouds and his chariots like whirlwind. The horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. Uh, I'll stop there and read, go through this. If you think about it, and again, any description you read in the history books of, of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they were, they had fast chariots, they were, they were ruthless, and they were very powerful. And the nations that they over, that they, set upon to overcome, they did. Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant military person, uh, akin to uh, Alexander the Great, if you will, as far as being smart in military matters. Then God turns to them, wash your heart from evil of Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? For a voice, to, I'm going to read verse 15. For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims wickedness from out of Ephraim. Report it to the nations now. Proclaim over Jerusalem besiegers from a far country. Lift their voices against the city of Ju Judah. Like a watchman of the field, they are against her roundabout because she has rebelled against me, declares the Lord. Your ways and your deeds have brought these things to you. This is your evil. 
How bitter? How has it touched your heart? But again, in the middle of all this woe, <clears throat> verse 14, a call to repentance. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? Again, God is in the middle of all this judgment. God reaches out his hand. If you repent, if you turn away, this I'll save you. You'll be okay. Turn back to me. He continues to call that. He calls to us when we're on an errant path as his children, and we're on, if we're not his children, he calls for us. His arms are outstretched. He wants people to come to him, not willing that any should perish. And yet, we have a free will. And if we decide, like Israel did, to continue to, I call it spit in God's eye, to continue not to follow his ways, he will judge us. And in the case of Israel, since Israel is a physical nation, he judged the nation of Israel. In the case of people that are an eternal, I think a far worse judgment falls on those who don't trust Christ as their Savior. Because they, all they have to look forward to is an eternity in hell, separation from the grace and love of God. As Pastor Justin pointed out in the series on heaven and hell, it's not separation from God. It's separation from God's grace and God's love. God's in hell. God's everywhere. God's judgment is there. I won't we'll go so far as to what, uh, who was it, um, Spurgeon or... Jonathan Edwards said that uh, we'll have a window in heaven to be able to look down into hell and to thank God we're not there. I don't go that I don't believe that. Although, rich man Lazarus, they could see, rich man could see Lazarus, and Lazarus could see the rich man. So we plug forward. Let's, let's read verses uh, 19 to 31. Try and get that part. My anguish, my anguish, I write in pain, oh, the walls of my heart. My heart is beating wildly. I cannot keep silent, for I hear the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Crash follows heart on crash. The whole land is laid waste. Suddenly my tents are laid waste, my curtains in a moment. How long must I see the, um, the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good, they know not. How far am I supposed to go? Go, go to 31. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked at the mountains, and behold, they were quaking. And all the hills moved to and fro. I looked and behold, there was no man. And all the birds of the air had fled. I looked and behold, the fruitful land was a desert. And all its cities were laid in ruins. Before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation. Yet I will not make a full end. For this is the earth shall mourn. And the heavens above be dark. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. At the noise of horsemen and archer, every city takes to flight. They enter thickets, they climb among rocks. All the cities are forsaken, and no man dwells in them. And you, O oh desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself with the ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you beautify yourself. You, your lovers despise you. They seek your life. For I heard a cry as of a woman in labor. Anguish is of one giving to her first child, giving birth to her first child. The cry of the daughter of Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands. Woe is me. I am fainting before murderers. Looking at that, does God take pleasure in... in Visiting judgment on his people? I don't think so. I don't think so. Either. But God is a, okay, God is righteous. God is full of love, but he's also just. 
and God's justice demands when people are not following his ways, his laws, that he visits his anger upon them. Why well, you got to look at the Sodom and Gomorrah? They got to visit on them. And yet Jesus in the New Testament says, it'll be easier in the day of judgment for people in Sodom and Gomorrah than those that have had the light told to them. And I, I would akin that to our nation today. How much harsher will God's judgment be on our nation? We are founded on godly principles by deists and Christians. Um, how much harsher will God's judgment be on us as a nation? That's what's scary. Because we have the light. And you can buy a Bible anytime you want. You can turn on the radio and listen to God's word being proclaimed 24-7. Or on the internet or wherever. And yet, um, I can't. the number of porn pornography sites and the number of uh, uh, wife swapping sites, we, we'll get into that in a minute. Should be, we'll, see, we'll see God's judgment against that in a moment. But you remember, Scott, what you said about the thorn, the, the soil and everything? Yes. Because they hear it, they, they may hear, but they're not paying attention to it because they live in that worldly life. And Seeing they cannot see and hear, they cannot hear, right? And yet, it's available to them. But God holds them respect. Even though they don't want to see, God still hold. God held Israel responsible for the light that they had. They had the light. They had the law. They had the law. They had all the their past miracles that God has done for them over the years. Now, remember, at this time, Josiah is king in Israel. Josiah is attempting or has done a um, revival, if you will. Had the law read, people got weak need when they read the law, and Josiah tore his clothing. Was he was assured, King Josiah was assured that, that the destruction of Israel wouldn't happen during his lifetime. Of course, he, he died early, which Jeremiah lamented. So did Isaiah. Okay, so again, uh, the other thing I noticed when you, if you look through this, um, he kind of goes back to the beginning. The earth was formless and void. Heavens had no light. I looked on the mountains, they were quaking, and the hills moved to and fro. That's going back to the very beginning of the world, if you will. But what does God say? God, the world was, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Lord God said, Let there be light. Going back to the absolute very beginning. And again, God created all of this birds of the heaven. There was no man. Birds of the heaven uh, created created uh, trees and land and, and grass and growing things. But then he talks in verse 26 about a, a, a de, deconstruction. Maybe that's, maybe that's the decreation, uncreation, where things are uncreated. Uh, the fruitful land was a wilderness. The cities now were pulled down. Before the Lord, before his fierce anger, that's verse 26. The whole land shall be a desolation. And yet, in verse 27, again, he comes back to, and tells them, yet I will not execute a complete destruction. When I read that, I thought of Israel has always been, I mean, there's all, the Jews as a people have always been. He, throughout history, even before 1948, they might have been scattered throughout the world under persecution, but they were still a people. How many Babylonians do you know? How many Philistines do you know? Uh, About a thousand. Do you? Well, maybe <laughs> wicked Philistines, but we're talking uh, my dream as a nationality. Home. Yeah. Uh, God did not destroy them as a people. I will not execute a complete destruction. So God, in the middle of this terrible prophecy, he promises them, I'm not going to completely eradicate you as, as a race of the people, but all this is going to happen to you. So God holds out the candle. Again, earlier in chapter four, we talked about God, turn around, come back to me. Here God says, I'm going to execute this judgment because of what you've done. But even though I'm going to execute this judgment, I am not going to completely destroy the land. It's like, you know, God is our father and he chastises us because he gives, you know, it's like a parent who chastises your kids because you want them to see the errors of your ways and give them a chance, you know, to correct what they're doing. So that's right. what God is doing. They're not listening. Right. 
Well, he, he does it in our lives. Um, and God's providential hand, I'm a firm believer in that God is a, um, God's hand is in our lives. God directs our paths. Um, I would say as, as believers, I mean, God's providence is out there for everyone. Things happen the way they should. Um, look at the crucifixion. We just finished celebrating the crucifixion, uh, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Christ. Was Pontius Pilate uh, responsible for condemning our Lord to the cross? Will he pay a price for that? <coughs> oh, but he did okay. give in to God. Okay. And the religious leaders. Jesus told him that uh, the people who turned you over to me, turned me over to you are still going to suffer greater condemnation. He didn't let Pilate off the hook. Pilate could wash his hands till he had chapped hands in that bowl, washing his hands of it. But still, it was his it was his condemnation that put Christ to death. And back in the Middle Ages, uh, before the Middle Ages, the when they uh, what was that time when the Jews were utterly uh, Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, and the, the French Inquisition, and the different times when Jews were judged and when they went to the Holy Land, and Jews were uh, made to convert to Christianity or die, um, they blamed, quote unquote, blamed the Jews for killing Jesus. Well, we know that Pilate was, he was a, not a Jew, he was a Gentile. Uh, and by his own admission, my Jew. He's not. He wasn't. And yet God holds him responsible. God through providence. Everything happens the way God figures it's going to happen. God has everything. The giant chessboard. I wish I could see the chessboard sometimes. But God uh, has everything according to his purpose. And yet we who make the decisions, if you will, in our lives, we're responsible for the decisions we make. God holds us responsible. Even though God's providence may be that he knows we're going to do this, which came first, the chicken or the egg. You know, we do this on, of our own volition, which is against God. We're held responsible for it. But, and yet, God knows that we're going to do that, hold us responsible for it. Okay. Let's begin verse, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. How far do you want to go? How about verses 1 through 9? Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search your prayer to see if you can find a man, one who does justice and seeks truth, that I may pardon her. Though they say, as the Lord lives, yet they swear falsely. O Lord, do, do not your eyes look for truth. You struck them down, but they feel no anguish, felt no anguish. You have consumed them but they refuse to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. Then I said, these are only the poor. They have no sense, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. I will go to the great and will speak to them, for they know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. But they all alike had broken the yoke. They had burst the bonds. Therefore, a lion from the forest shall strike them down. A wolf from the desert shall devastate them. A le leopard is watching their cities. Everyone who goes out of them shall be torn to pieces. Because their transgressions are many, their, their apostates are, apostasies are great. How can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me and have sworn by those who are no gods. When I fed them to the full, they committed adultery and truth to the houses of whores. They were well fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? Is, wow, a lot of good stuff in here uh, as far as uh, uh, talking about judgment from God. Um, I look at verse uh, I 
I looked at verse 6. Therefore, a lion from the forest will slay them. A wolf of the desert, a wolf of the deserts will destroy them. A leopard is watching their cities. Uh, Habakkuk 1, verse 8. I'll read it. It's an obscure verse in the Habakkuk. Their horses are faster than leopards and quicker than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen, their horsemen charge along. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour. Now, there are no airplanes back then. But God still uses the eagle as a, a swift swiftness of destruction. Have you ever seen an eagle catch or, capture prey or get something on the ground? It's swift. They dive at an unprecedented number of miles per hour, come down, grab it, grab whatever their prey is, and kill it and eat it. I mean, it's like, but it's almost instantaneous. If you were watching it, you have to do slow motion photography and see it coming down, grabbing, and taking back off. Uh, and again, this is what God is warning them is going to happen to Israel. It's going to happen fast. Um, verses 7 and 8 just blow my mind. Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. And verse 7 especially spoke to me. Think about the United States. We have, there's never been a nation with as much as we have had. We're the richest nation in the history of the world. <clears throat> when I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the harlot's house. Now, in, in verse 7, he's talking about leaving God. I have a God. question regarding um, the United States being the richest country in the world. Yes. Um, it, if, we, if that's considered that way, why um, would it be considered that way with um, the trillions of dollars that we owe? That doesn't seem rich to me. It it's, seems like major debt. It is major debt. So really? how could we can be considered, um, you know? I think it was in the past. Well, we, well we're still, we're, look how we're living today. Are you, are, are you hungry? Yeah, yeah, but are we still considered the richest country in the world? I mean, considering... The debt we owe? Yes. It doesn't even make sense to me. Our, our economy is now based not on gold, but on the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Based on, and I'm not going to get, Mike, your son could do this real well. I'm not an economist. What's that? I'm talking about, are we the richest nation in the world? Yeah. Your um, son's an economist. He could talk about the economy yeah. where we're at. Our debt is is still not even close to a year's uh, GDP, so we're, you know, and half that debt we owe to ourselves. Right. Yeah. You know, well, we owe others. You too. get your. What's that, Scott? We owe others too because China's bought a lot of our debts. We do. They bought some of our debt. Um, there's no doubt we got too much debt at the present time, but. And we're, we're certainly adding to it at the moment, which is unfortunate. But, yeah, the, the United States is without a doubt the, the richest country in history. So uh, we don't have much excuse as far as, uh, you know, following the right path here. That's, that's what you're trying to say, I guess, Scott. Yes. And uh, when we got fat, when we were fattened, if you will, as we achieved this, you're, you're not hungry. None of us go hungry every night, I hope. Um, we are blessed with uh, a roof over our head. Uh, go, take a trip to uh, any nation other than the United States. Canada is pretty prosperous. Um, go, just go south to Mexico. See how people live down there. Shanties and checks. Take a trip to the Bahamas. I've and, been to the Bahamas. I've been to Jamaica. And yeah, they do. They have the rich part and they have the poor part. We're in tour city and all that. But that's how they make their money is to tourism and everything like that. And it is true how- But the people working in the hotels live in those shanty towns mm -hmm. with corrugated seal as their home. As their home. We are the only nation in the world where people go in their car to get their, they drive in their car to get their food stamps. You know, um, it's, now, we are processed so beyond measure as a nation, we really are. God has blessed us beyond all other nations in the world, ever.
and we're so what does God it. think about all this debt? Um, it's going to kill us eventually, probably. But we are living prosperously right now. We are eating and we're drinking and, and marrying and giving in marriage, and then came sudden destruction. That's what happened to Israel. Israel was fat, dumb, and happy at this time. Uh, they had uh, they had uh, all the goods that they could want. Their grapes and their their crops were in their agrarian society. Their crops were coming in beautifully. Everything was going this fine. And yet God well, was yeah, God can change things in an instant. Yes, he can. That's what we're talking about, that he did. And that will happen to us too, actually, in my opinion. But we still do have people in the United States that do go hungry, don't have money. And not everybody rides to get in a car to get food stamps no. either. No, this is you know. Yes, there's thousands in California that are homeless. Yeah. They poop on the streets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we what well, we have, mm -hmm. what well, we have, but it's a lot of people. There's not a lot of people. There's, there's they, they don't they, okay. I would say that we are a nation of 330 million people. There's less than right now homeless wise less than 500 thousand homeless people in the United States. Um. When you go to other nations, we're talking half the population, three quarters of the population is below the poverty line. Yeah, yeah, Yemen is really bad right, right now. Haiti, look at Haiti. Yeah. There's a there's a country that sold the sold of the devil, literally, uh, and they're what, eighty percent poverty. It, it's horrible. We are blessed. Well, it's because countries. of the governments. The um, governing people are evil, isn't that correct? I mean, they, they want everything for themselves. <laughs> they don't care about their people. That can help. They can hurt too, sure. And probably the soup, people are more interested in looking good, getting votes, and they are solving problems. It's like the old saying throwing money at the problem is not going to solve problems. So, you know, in this fish, a lifetime, but so many of these things are like, oh, we're going to send them a billion dollars. Okay, the people in charge of the country are taking 99% of that from themselves. Right, exactly. Right, right. right. Yeah. And that happened here, exactly right. Well, so, um, the, uh, the, um, the first room in the youth wing and uh, Steve's old office, I don't think those doors open because the road just looked right. I'm just going to let them air out a little bit. I think I'm good. Those guys, thank you, everybody. Uh, so you, thank we'll you. see you tonight. Thank you, So am I answering the question now or not? I think we can move on. <laughs> okay. We don't want to spend all night. I mean, right? No, no, no. I mean, morning. Yeah. No, no. And, and I understand what you're saying, but again, as a nation, we do have a. There's poverty in the United States. Go to West Virginia, Appalachia. Now, there's still issues there, but as as a whole, we are a prosperous nation, and we live. We have been blessed beyond all measure by God, and we are turning and just like Israel. And here we go, uh, verse uh, 9, or verse, uh, let's see. Oh, verse 8 is, is really telling. And they were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's what? Again, sexual immorality. If you look at uh, the world, um, at different nations who have achieved World Dominion, the Roman Empire, uh, Great Britain, at one time, France at one time, um, they all have achieved uh, all have achieved a measure of success, and at their pinnacle, they started a decline. Uh, Great Britain arguably turned away from God from its roots. Go see what's happening in, in Great Britain today. And Great Britain is a uh, um, a shadow of its former self. France is even, I heard of, uh, France, uh, one politician or historian, I should say, uh, akin France to a raped old bag, meaning she's just powerless and she's moved, she's doing stuff, but it's like nothing compared to what they were in their prime. And they've turned away from God, more so than we have. Like Canada has turned away from, if you preach against homosexuality, in Canada now, they're going to arrest you. They'll come to your church and arrest, and they have. Now, there are pastors being arrested in Canada today. That's coming to our nation. Sooner probably rather than later. There will be a day in this country when pastors preaching the gospel, 
preaching warning to the people will be arrested. Because now Romans 1, again, everything that's good is evil and everything that's evil is good. We are fast approaching that. But verse 8 really tickled me. Each one naming after his neighbor's wife. Sexual immorality is the first sign that, and read again, read Romans 1. It starts with sexual immorality, then it moves down to uh, homosexuality, and we're, we're now to the point where we are uh, thinking themselves wise, they became fools, exchanging uh, the love of God for uh, something else, and they their minds became darkened. We can't reason anymore. Read the paper, read what the government, some of the decisions that are being made in government. Uh, I'm not, this is not a political statement, it's just we are under a curse. I just keep praying. I just keep praying. Pray. Because we can't do it, only nope. God can do it. He can. Yeah. He can change hearts. Yeah. He can and will change hearts. We have to pray. We have to turn away from our evil and turn turn back to God as a nation. And if I did your call by my name, he promised us that. That turn away, I will heal the land. Um, verse 9, shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord? And on a nation such as this shall I not avenge myself. Okay, let's read verses 10 through 18. <clears throat> Go through her vine rows and destroy what but make not a full end. Strip away, make not a full end. Strip away your branches, for they not they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have utterly been utterly treacherous to me, declares the Lord. They have spoken falsely of the Lord, and they have said, He will do nothing, no disaster will come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. The prophets will become wind, and the word is not in them, they thus shall it be done to them. There, Go ahead. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth of fire, and this people would, and the fire shall consume them. Behold, I am bringing against you a nation from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb, and <clears throat> they are mighty warriors. They shall eat up your harvest and your food. They shall eat up your sons and your daughters. They shall eat up your flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees, your fortified cities, in which you trust. They shall beat down with a sword. But even in those days, declares the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And again talking about, and this is not a pretty picture. I mean, we're talking here destruction. God proclaiming against them. Uh, verse 13, their prophets are as wind. The word is not in them. Thus will it be done to them. Again, people that are saying, peace, peace, peace and safety, everything's fine. God's not going to judge us. We're okay. And again, the prophets are as of wind, meaning they're speaking hot air. They're speaking untruth. They're not speaking the word of the Lord. So God, again, verse 14 through 18, but actually 14 through 17, just tells them what's going to happen. And it's, it's not a, a good picture at all. Um, God warns them. And yet, there is verse 18. Like we talked about in the last section. Yet, even in those days, declares the Lord, I will not make you a complete destruction. So again, he promises them, it's, it's, if we're going to, going to visit my wrath upon you, you're going to be judged, but it won't be a complete destruction. I'll insert that in here, since I'm doing analogies between Israel and the United States, we don't have that promise. Uh, if you read your Bible, the United States is not mentioned at all in the New Testament, in, in prophecy, in Revelation. So, things happening in the Middle East, we are a footnote uh, on the page of history before the Bible. Not, nothing in the Bible about us. And I know that uh, the Worldwide Church of God and a couple other, I call them cults because they are, uh, 
believe that the United States is in prophecy. Uh, but again, we don't see anything particularly referencing the United States in the Bible. So we won't be here in the final, um, the final judgment falls, if you will. I like the way you say we're a flip note. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're not even in the Bible. I never even thought of it. Yeah, we are not. Uh, Roman Empire is coming back. Uh, the Roman Empire will be resurrected in those days, mm. in the end times, and uh, that's part of the judgment at the end. Babylon, if you will, is resurrected. And but the Roman eagle, Bernard McGee likes to point out that the Roman Empire never was really destroyed. It's got to fall apart because the Visigoths came over the hill and, and the Gauls came over the hill. All that, but and yet, but they were never really destroyed, they just kind of fell apart, and so they will be resurrected. And there's been attempts to do it the European Union, common market. Uh, eventually, there'll be someone that comes along, a really brilliant person, brilliant man, that will resurrect the Roman Empire. He will be the first, the Roman Empire, and then the world. He'll be the most brilliant person that's ever been born outside of Christ. Most brilliant man. And, and dynamic and charismatic and someone that everyone will follow. He'll be he'll speak words that will just people will just adore this guy. He'll be safe. Well, could that be Joe Biden? I'm just kidding. No. It's, we're talking about the Antichrist. Oh okay. It, it, that, that's okay. Yeah. No. It's, it'll be the Antichrist. The person, the man of sin, if you will. But he will be, I'm telling you, if Jesus said, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Because this guy is going to be incredible. He really is. I can't even begin to tell you how charismatic and how drawing people to him he will be. He will promise them everything, and people will believe him. And there will be a time of unprecedented peace for about three and a half years. And all of a sudden, when you least expect it, things turn to you know what. And his true colors come out. And then there's war and famine and pestilence. And the four horsemen of the apocalypse come running. And they're not a football team. They're actually curses from God. And will fall upon. <clears throat> but that is coming. And that person will bring that back together. Israel here is promised they will never, they will be totally destroyed. I'm not going to do a complete destruction. And they have that promise. Israel does. Like I said, we do know. All right, enough of end times prophecy. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> let's, let's finish this by reading verse 19 to 31. And when your people say, why has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve foreigners in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand on the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that can it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. <clears throat> but this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have kept good from you. For wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap, they catch men. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice, the cause of the fatherless, to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? 
and there I, I not avenge myself on the nation such as this. An appalling and a horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? And that, that's pretty much self-explanatory. Again, it's uh, uh, God's, God is condemning them for people being wicked, uh, doing evil deeds. Um, God, God, again, says, they don't say in their heart, let's not, verse 24, let's not fear the Lord our God who gives rain in season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. God has blessed them with food, with the ability to grow crops. Um, I, I make the analogy to the United States. We are, uh, we are the world's leader in producing food. There is no one else that produces food on a scale that we do. We are net exporters of food. We look for markets to sell our food because we're making some. And we're very wasteful of our food, too. We, know, we are. Yes, yeah. it was my first thought when you were saying that. Yeah, it is. And it's the tons and tons of food. And yet that will all come to an end. Um, God, again, if you look at what's going on as far as tornadoes, earthquakes, and uh, mudslides, and rain, and and the drought, all it takes is a word. If you're familiar with history, the dust bowl, the dust bowl from the 30s, uh, all the land stopped producing everything out there. It was ugly. It was a bad time. God got our attention. God will get our attention again. So, uh, verse 28 they're fat they're, and they're, they're sleek, excel in deeds of wickedness. Don't plead the cause uh, of the orphan that they may prosper. In other words, take advantage of the poor. Um, don't defend the rights of the poor. Again, we can talk about our legal system. Our legal system has issues. We are getting to a point now where if you don't have money, uh, you're going to have trouble in court because the public defender can't defend you against. Uh, they won't defend you the same way. They feel a lot of money. You can hire a good lawyer and you have your kind of justice and not your justice. We're in the I just got a thing in the mail yesterday um, that I put on Facebook. Just have um, somebody help. Everybody help uh, David. Um, I think it is Listen or, or something. But anyways, he was the journalist um, for 30 years that went undercover to see what um, all of the um, officials and all these um, crazy peop uh, rich people did to aborted with aborted babies, uh -huh. like and um, the whole kit and the woodle. So then um, the Harris got him arrested and he's like in deep trouble, yep. but yet he's still fighting back. But he needs, it says, um, according to letter, he needs $6 million to, to fight against them. So what you're saying is true. Yeah. So again, we are, we are now in a nation where money, it takes money to defend yourself um, for right, right causes. Um, and again, God will judge us for that. Um, and again, Verse 31 is really telling. Um, I, I read John 3, 19. Um, John 3, 19. And again, verse 31 says, Prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. What, what will you do at the end of it? John 3, 19, did you find it? Yeah, Jesus is talking here. 319. Yes. Okay. And this is the condemned condemnation. condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Okay. Again, that goes right along with verse 31 in Jeremiah. People would rather sin and find pleasure in sin more so than doing right. And when in Jesus' time, when Jesus came into the world, he condemned them. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and the middle of darkness rather than light because they're either evil. Unfortunately, people run people as um, humans as a race run pretty much for a true form. We love evil and we hate good um, without God's help. Okay. It's seven o'clock. Uh, Lori, you're off today, so you get to have a day. You have to go to work probably, right? 
Well, no, I, I'm not off. All the offices work unless they take vaca vacation time. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So I'm yeah. working. It'll be very productive. Nobody's there. Right, exactly. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, let's uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Why don't we close, uh, close with a word of prayer? Who'd like to pray for us this morning as we go? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you, thank you, Lord, and I also want to say a special prayer for Debbie, for, um, for the doctors to find out what's going on with her throat, and also for my son as he travels to California this morning, Lord, I pray for his life, and also for his friends, Lord, and I pray for all of us um, as we go out today that we need someone to talk and be able to share the gospel as we learn from Scott for Pastor Justin and pray for our whole church and our church leaders and elders and for the um, auxiliaries that we have here, Lord, until we're able to meet again, Lord, also for our children as well and our families and our grandchildren as well, Lord. I pray this in your name, in Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you all this morning for coming.